Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you for making time for this. I'm sure you have a lot of things going on. I will forgive you're wearing a Deftones shirt and I'll forgive you for yes. that. This is a safe space where it's okay to wear Deftones shirts. Dude, I have, I have no shame. Like I, so I'm a very, ooh, I'm kind of a strict Deftones fan. Like I'm just an adrenaline and around the fur dude. Like I do like White Pony, but adrenaline around the fur were like seminal records for me growing up. So I don't, I don't really stray far from that. Is, is, is that, that a thing that? in the Deftones fandom? Like some people only like the first two or something, unless like White Pony, like a dividing line in the fandom. That's yeah. Like I, I mean, I do dig White Pony, but it's not, it's never a go-to for me, dude. Like I adrenaline around the first still just hold up for me. Just like timeless, you know? Gotcha. Well, you know, you know me, I'm, I'm not a Deftones fan, but that's okay. <laughs> We can still be friends. <laughs> Why don't you like the Deftones? I want I want to know. Uh, they're fine. It's more just like I'm an asshole, and um, whenever people have like just that kind of excessive level of enthusiasm for a thing, it irritates me. You know what I mean? I get it. I'm not like I'm not that dude. I'm not saying I'm not you, but like just you know like, how it is in general. Yeah, like I do love the Deftones, but. I'm not that, I'm not that hardcore about it, but gotcha. Yeah. Well, uh, you've got a lot to talk about. I kind of actually didn't realize, uh, how many things you had been involved in until I was looking at your Wikipedia and I was like, damn, this guy's had his hands on a lot of shit. So a few things here and there. Yeah. So there's a lot for us to talk about, but what have you been up to recently? Call out the past six months or something like that. Oh man. Um, well, as for everybody, the pandemic was a motherfucker. Um, we've, you know, just doing, uh, doing siren shit. Um, we just got back from, well, just got back. It's been a few months now, but we we're in Nashville doing a record and it is almost done. We play um, our first show back in like over 600 days or something crazy like that. Um, yeah. Next Thursday for emo night in Vegas. And yeah. And so we, we do that. And then we fly to LA the following day to finish the record with Zach Servini. Oh, and everybody's working with Zach now. Shout out to Zach. Yeah. Zach is the man. He's my neighbor. So like we're, we've been like, he's been kind of like in my like quarantine bubble over the past, you know, year and a half. So it's been, it's been really, really cool. Who, who are you with in uh, Nashville? So we're working with Andrew Bayless and uh, we did, we released a song, was it early this year, last year? I can't remember when we released the shit, but um, we did a song with him and loved it called Bloody Knuckles. And we were like, let's just, let's just do more songs with him. And then that turned into like 12 songs later, having a ton of material with him. So we, uh, so we work with him in Nashville and now we're just kind of doing the finishing touches. We're at that point where we have like 11 strong songs, but we feel like we could beat a few of them and try to top it. So we're going to go to Zach and just do a couple songs and then just call it. I think hopefully by, you know, the end of the month, just the record will be completely done. So that's the plan of attack. We'll, uh, we'll see what happens after our time with the sack, but I imagine that we'll be, we'll be done with it. How was it doing a record kind of having been off the road and sort of, you know, out of the usual groove of being a band? Dude, that's like, I was so, I was, I was nervous. Like I was legit nervous going into a studio with the dudes and we haven't even seen each other. Like we haven't, we all live in different states one i mean our drummer lives in australia so like we have not spent any time together so there was definitely that um there was that right. nervousness going into it of like are are we even going to be able to you know pump out even just a couple songs like let alone like a record are we kind of are we thinking too too far here like too much with this so do we just book a couple days but you know it it's always interesting when we go in the studio because it happens really quick. 
like everything goes down really quick. Like the first three days we were in Nashville, we had written and recorded fully like five songs. So, and that was from scratch. So we, we just got like right back into a groove and that felt, that was like a big, like sigh of relief, you know, going in just after those first few days going, all right, like we're, it's not even like we still got it. It was just a moment of, you know, we're, we're in a creative space. This feels really good. Let's just, let's, let's spend the next few weeks just banging out more songs. So that's what we did. And it just felt, it just felt fucking great. Fucking yeah. great. Cool. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, I assume there's plans for tours and stuff. Yeah, there's man. The touring world right now is still so funky. It's, it's still pretty like upside down and, you know, what's happening right now is uh, we want to really hit the ground running next year, but so does, so is every other artist yeah, and every band right. you can think of. So but you guys are a big band. So I feel like you probably, you know, get bumped up in the line, at least somewhat. I mean, uh, I mean, we, we've had, we have like different windows of opportunities and it's just trying to figure out what works. And we're also trying to coincide that obviously with the new record. So, but even then, like, it's still been hard. It's been really difficult to lock down venues and dates because everyone is fighting. Everyone right. is fighting for, for, for space right now. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we are working on touring plans and we, you know, want to get back overseas, but that's like a whole other thing in itself. So right. we're just trying to focus on at least just trying to get the U S locked down. So. I think that's a dynamic. The sort of log jam thing is something that I don't think a lot of fans have thought about is like, yeah, your favorite band wants to go tour, but like you said, so does everyone else. And there's only so many venues of a certain size in any city on any given night. And there's probably literally 50 people that want to play it that night. And it just, not everyone can do it. Dude, that's exactly it. And I think that, I mean, I don't, I'm guessing that, fans know that or understanding that i don't even know you know i, I mean but why, I think why, that, they don't they're not gonna i don't you know we can't expect them to think about that you know they're just like come no. play in nashville because i want you to you know yeah it's, they don't like why worry aren't you about my city like well we want to but yeah. there's also 50 other artists that same week that are trying to fight for venues you know it's tough yeah well i i hope that at least this will be great a great year for all the venues yeah, I hope so too. I mean, it's it's sad because I'm sure you've seen it like over the last year and a half, there's a lot of venues that didn't make it through the pandemic. So it's that's also been a thing. You know, we we had had a tour booked with Amity Affliction, um, you know, in like June of last year. And then a bunch of venues from that tour, you know, a few venues from that tour, I don't think are venues anymore. So it, things are just it's, it's, it's a weird, it's, it's still a really weird time, you know? Yeah. So you joined Sleeping with Sirens. Was it before or after Feel? It was, they had already recorded Feel and they were about to start doing uh, tours around it. And that's when I joined. Got it. Okay. So like right after yeah. that. Yeah. Which was yeah. probably a pretty crazy time to join the band. It was. And I, I, I came into that whole situation, not really knowing anything about the band. Um, I, I was in a band before that, which we can get into whenever, yeah. but we, I, I had actually left the music industry. I was completely over it. I, I was oh. like, I don't want to be on tour again. I don't even want to pick up a guitar. I don't want to be on stage. Like I am done. Like I what just want to be out. So I ended up starting a, a screen printing business in San Diego and just completely dedicated all of my time, my efforts, like everything, just, I just poured myself into that. And then um, I was getting to a point where I was like, I need a vacation. I was working like, you know, like 14, 15 hour days and hadn't taken any time off. I was like, I need to just go somewhere. And quite literally, I got a call from Kellen and he said, dude, we need to fill in for Europe UK. Like, I know you're not touring anymore, but you know, we, it would be awesome if you were interested and want to do it. And I just viewed that as like a, a, a door, a, like a, a, you know, a paid ticket 
to go overseas to travel for a bit. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, let's, let's do it. You know? And so you were just, just expecting this to be like a tour. Yeah. That was what they asked me. They just asked me to do, it was like two or three weeks of a Europe UK tour. And, um, and the tour was just nuts. You know, I went out there and I was like, wow, like this band, <laughs> this band is a lot popular than, than I thought or had anticipated. Yeah. But really the love for, for playing again, like just came, it just hit me like a shit ton of bricks. I was like, man, I really, really miss this. And fortunately, like a week into that tour, they had, you know, they were like, can we talk to you for, for a minute in the back of the bus? And I was like, yeah. And I thought, it, I thought it was, I thought I fucked up or <laughs> things weren't working like, out. You kinda suck. Really. And um, they're like, uh, you know, we have a, we have a tour um, in the U S after this. And just want to know if you want to do that too. And I was like, cool, let's do it. And then that just, it just kept going after that. They just, I just kept on playing with them. It, there wasn't even really like any more discussions after that. I was just, I was just with them. And then right before the world tour started with Pierce the Veil, literally the day, I think before it started, they just asked if I wanted to, you know, officially be in the band. And that was, that was it was history after that. So what'd you do with the screen printing company? Um, they, they, I, I left and then they went completely, (laughs) um, like they just, they couldn't survive. I think they, you know, lasted for another year and a half, two years and, and folded. So that was it. So you you were, you had some other partners or something like that. And you're just like, this is on you guys now or. Yeah, we had, um, we, you know, we had a bunch of employees at the time, fortunately, but they just couldn't, I, I, I was doing everything and I was the main point of contact and I had all of the relationships with all of these, um, different vendors and, you know, people that we were working with. And once I left, they, they all decided to take their business elsewhere. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. And so then it's off to, off to the races and it's been almost 10 years now. <laughs> Isn't that horrifying? It's crazy. Yeah. Well, so before that, what's, I, I, you, you've done a lot of stuff. Like I said, um, I actually didn't know that you were in drugs. Um, was that yeah. what you were doing before? Was that like your last musical thing before Sleep with the Sirens? Yeah, that was it. That was what I was doing before that. I was just, um, cruising in that band, having, a, having a good time. And then things were just not as fun anymore. And, um, we all, all the members of the band minus our singer, Craig, um, you know, we quit on the same day you know, we were in Michigan in the studio and things just, things just weren't feeling right for a while. And uh, we just called it. And when we called it, I just said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like, I'm not going to be in a band anymore. I'm, I'm over this shit. And that was it. Yeah. What is it? I mean, I, I can relate to that, uh, I, I think, because there's lots of things about the music industry that make me just want to tear my eyes out. Um, but what what is it that made you, I mean, that, like, there's lots of people that would kill to, you know, have achieve that level of success. What is it that after you had climbed this far up the ladder, you're like, fuck this, I'm over it. I mean, I, I think what, how do I, how do I word this? Um, Don't worry, know, nobody's I, listening. It's okay. I, well, I think this goes for any business that you're in, even outside of the music industry is when, uh, when you're in a really tight knit, tight knit group of people that you're working with constantly, when there's, when there's just one person that is not on the same page, or there's one person that that just that just like I said, just isn't on the same page. It just doesn't. It's just not. It's not fun when there's when there's an element to what you're doing that is taking taking the fun out of what you're doing. Yeah, it's just not. There's just a point where it's just not worth it to your mental health anymore, and. I was, it was taking a toll on me and I was, you know, I was, I was drinking heavily. Like I was, I, I realized, you know, looking back on that now that I was just really 
numbing myself. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the dudes in the band felt the same way. And, you know, we were just kind of partying our way through it. And yep. then you see it with clear eyes when it hits us all like a shit ton of bricks, um, hanging out together. We just have that moment of, I, I, I this isn't worth it anymore. Um, so was it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not trying to stir up drama, but it sounds like you guys were not getting along with Craig. Is that the deal? Um, yeah, we, we, just, it, we were not aligned. We yeah. weren't aligned, you know, right. and that was, and that was something that we all continuously tried to work on, you know, through, through the band's history, like what, as we were together, but, um, you know, it was just, it was really difficult. It, it was, it was really, really hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of, I, I mean, I don't know if it's the same, but back when I was drinking like, you know, six to seven days a week, uh, I don't feel like I ever had an alcohol problem. I had a life problem, which I tried to avoid by drinking and doing drugs. And then as soon as I fixed that life problem, I just instantly didn't want to drink anymore. That you did that. I, that's a, that you like nailed it with that. I think that there was a lot of, you know, things for me personally that I was just sweeping under a rug for a really long time, even before, you know, joining the band drugs, like, well before that and um e even going well into my 30s like i'm i'm 38 now and i haven't had a, a sip of alcohol in over three years now and it's really because life just wasn't wasn't what i wanted it to be so i i realized that there was just things in my life i had to eliminate that definitely were not helping my situation and that that was one of them you know and and looking back on all of that and just seeing that it was, it was a bit of a crutch, you know, I was leaning on that too much. And I'm sure you've had other artists on here that have spoken about this possibly, but you know, it's, it is the most accepted, okay thing to drink in excess, um, being in a band, being on tour. Yeah. It's, I always say it's easier to get a beer than it is to get a bottle of water. Um, for sure. Or frowned, like go to the gym or, upon. you know, it's not frowned upon. If you want to start doing shots, as soon as you get up in the morning and crack open beers, like there's nobody, nobody says like, dude, maybe you shouldn't, yeah. maybe you shouldn't start drinking at eight in the morning. <laughs> um, you know, like that our lifestyle is as crazy and as chaotic and out of control as you want it to be. And no, there's no, there really isn't anyone saying um, you know, don't do Pump that. Breaks. It's on you. So it's a, it's a, it, and that's something that I had to really understand and about myself and what, and as I get older, like I can't, I can't drink like that anymore. Like my hangovers last for days on end. It's just not, it's just not worth it. It's not, it's just not something that I want to do anymore. So I just, I just cut it out. The other thing is like, what a lot of people maybe don't realize is touring is fucking boring. A lot of times, you know, yeah. if you're, you know, headlining, you don't really, you know, you have sound check and maybe you have some press or whatnot, but like, you don't really have, there's a lot of hurry up and wait. You don't really have shit to do a lot of time. And it's like, well, what else is there to do, but drink with your friends that they are on tour with you? Fuck. Yeah, dude, there's so much downtime. There is so much downtime. And, um, it's really easy to fill that downtime with, just partying, you know, and, um, it just, it just doesn't, it just doesn't do it for me anymore, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate and grateful that i I've been, you know, been able to just cut that out on tour and not really have like an itch or an urge to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and it's always, you know, through like my almost like 20 years of touring, it's, it's sad and disheartening when you see people that you've toured with that really succumb to that and it, and it just takes over their life and, and they carry that with them off tour as well. Like they carry this lifestyle that they always feel like they have to be on tour still. Right. 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 And it's and one the, thing if they're it's like, tough. it's one thing if they're 23, but then they start get, getting to be more like our age and then it's, then it's dark. You know, and then it's like, it's okay, now you're a career, you know, partier. 
yeah yeah it's 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 not fun dude. <laughs> it's no. not fun at all yeah and and it, it it probably is not a challenge for you i would guess but i know for a lot of people who sort of struggle to maintain their sobriety it's hard to be around that stuff on tour and you know unless you're like the real big dick headliner you can't tell people no partying around me you know unless yeah. you're fucking david lee roth or whatever yeah. <laughs> but everyone else it's like well i can't tell other people not to do it so i gotta just like go hide in the bus all the time and, and then it's like it's, it's just it's tough for a lot of people and i mean fortunately like for you like it doesn't bother me at all to be around people who are drinking i don't give a shit no and i think that that was that was something that i had to work on with all the dudes and sirens you know when i decided that i wasn't going to drink anymore um i think immediately they were like well we better not invite him to like restaurants or bars anymore because he's what that's not going to help, you know? And they were, they were just being mindful of that, but just telling them like, no, it's okay. Like you guys can, you guys can do what you want. Like, this is just, you know, a personal decision for me and I'm not trying to change anybody else's, um, you know, wh whatever it is that you guys want to do, like, just, you, you guys can do it. I, 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 I have, I fortunately, you know, have like the willpower to just, like just i'm good i can just say no and I'm, I'm i'm good you can still go to the applebee's bar with the boys you'll just get the virgin flirtini <laughs> that's it right there dude <laughs> that is exactly it yeah um so you you have kind of been um i don't know if hired gun is the right word but according to wikipedia you've kind of says you have filled in for bands including slick shoes norma jean uh atreyu and Chiodos, that is quite a resume. How did you kind of end up being this person that sounds like you're the person who gets the call when they need someone to come in and do a thing for a while? Um, you know, I, I guess it's experience, but, um, and this is not me tooting my horn like whatsoever, but, you know, I'm just, I'm a person that I, I don't cause bullshit. I don't cause drama. I'm a very, I'm a pretty quiet person. I'm a pretty um, introverted person. Um, and I just, I show up like ready to do what I need to do, I guess, you know, and, um, I would say that I'm, I'm easy to get along with. And I think that all, and just being a nice person, I think that is something I learned really early on, um, getting into the industry is that just being a good human, a, a good human being, um, can take you really far <laughs> in the industry, surprisingly. Um, you know, it doesn't pay to be a dickhead. So I've just always been a person that's just been respectful of others. And I think that that's, I think that that's probably hopefully <laughs> what I'm, I'm known for uh, within the industry. Cause it's more than just uh, being able to tour or play guitar, or whatever it might be. Um, a lot of it is attitude and personality. And I've seen where that has, not worked for people um throughout my life and being in this industry is if you can be the most insane guitar player the most amazing singer in the world but if you are a dick and you don't treat people well i don't know many of those people that are still doing it you know yep. um so i think um you know just making contacts for as long as i've been doing this um and just having a good attitude along the way i think that that that's definitely helped me in my journey, I guess. I always like looking, uh, you know, on Wikipedia, they have like the band member timeline things. Yeah. I like looking at those bands where there's like 18 people that have been in the band and there's only one person that's in there the whole time. And you're like, hmm, I wonder, uh, <laughs> I wonder what like, the common denominator is, is here. <laughs> yeah, this is telling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not always the case, but, you know, no. you, you, usually it is. But it makes you, there's, 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 it makes you think. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a good lesson for people who, I mean, it, this is true of any industry. I remember my old boss, I've told the story before, but my old boss, uh, when I was at a design agency, uh, I, I was very good at my job, but I was kind of, uh, I was like 25 at the time or something like that. And I, in hindsight was kind of pushy and like forced my ideas on people and stuff. Cause I mean, I, I knew I was right. Yeah. Um, but I didn't understand being tactful. And uh, he was kind of a hard nosed old school guy. He used to like coach football and stuff. So he pulls me aside and he's like, Finn, let me tell you something. I was like, oh, what's that? And he's like, 
Nobody gives a shit how good you are at your job. They only care about whether they like working with you or not. It's true. And I was like, oh, I'm like, as soon as he told me, I was like, oh, fuck, I've made a terrible mistake. Dude, it's absolutely true, though. That is absolutely 100% true, man. So true. I mean, there's so many talented people, especially in music, super talented people that are just fucking incredibly unpleasant to be around. And it's like, nobody is that good that you can't be replaced. That, that you nailed it. You nailed it right on the head with that. You absolutely nailed it. It's true. And I think that's just such a good lesson for people is like, and, and by the way, if you're not the most talented person in the world, that's okay too. I mean, there's plenty of people that, uh, well, I won't name names, but there's plenty of people that <laughs> I was going to name an example of someone, but I, I don't know if he would agree with me or not. So I won't, but <laughs> There are, there are a couple of people I know who have been in a lot of extremely successful bands that I think would agree with me. They're not great musicians. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I, at best. I, yeah. I don't think that I'm a great guitar player. Like I am not a shredder and I've been playing guitar for tw over 25 years and I can't play a solo. Like I've always <laughs> right. just been a really solid rhythm kind of guitar player, like just I, and I, and when I knew that I was good at that, I was like, I'm going to be as good as fucking possible at being that rhythm guy. And it, and it's worked for me. It's totally worked for me. Like, and there's again, just so much to be said for just showing up. That's it. That's, that's, um, um, a line from a good friend of mine who, uh, he said this to me maybe five years ago. Um, we were working in the studio and, you know, he's been in the industry for a really, really long time. And someone had asked him like, what's like one piece of advice that you would give to like any aspiring artist or musician? He said, just show up. That's all you gotta do is just, just show up. Yep. And that, and it, it, it definitely means a multitude of things. And, um, but it seems so simple and so like dumb when you hear it, but it's, it's incredibly powerful and true though too. Like replying to emails, for example. Like, do, do you know uh, Matt from Periphery by any chance, Matt Halpern? Um, I think I've met him once before, yeah. So uh, I was introduced to him to work on him with this thing years ago, and I sent him an email, and he replied in like three minutes. And I was like, oh, okay, I know why this band is successful now. Yeah. Because there's so it, much of this it, where you're trying to offer someone an opportunity, and they just never reply to your emails, and you're like, okay, well, I guess we're not working together. Yeah. Actually, that's funny that you said that because um, before I had joined Drugs, I was playing like in, in a couple other like like Cinematic Sunrise and some kind of smaller projects. And um, a major booking agency had reached out to me, asking me if I'd want a position um, working as a potentially as like an assistant for a, a big booking agent. And they said the main reason why they asked me was because Whenever I was on emails involving them, I was always the first person to reply. And they said that that was the reason why they asked me was because, because I showed up because I was, I was replying immediately. I wasn't like letting things, you know, putting things off or procrastinating. They viewed that as this is, this is who we want working up for our agency. So yeah, little things like that, like go a long way. Yeah. It's, it seems like such a simple thing, but it is, uh, it is uh, tragically rare. It is. <laughs> so, uh, it how, really how do you, is. Feel, you know, you, you've been in bands with a lot of, you know, I guess you could say um, like big personalities or, you know, like Kellen and Craig are both stars, you know. Um, yeah. what, what is it like being in bands with people like that where like, you know, the spotlight is obviously on them, not you. How do you feel about that? Oh, it's never bothered me. Um, uh, it's I've never been. Uh, I guess this kind of goes back to like my character and who I am. I'm, I've always been a, a, I would say, a pretty selfless person. So, I've never been that person that's like I need to be front and center, and the spotlight needs to be on me. You know, I've always viewed, especially with being in a band and doing music, is that it's 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 a team. You know, and it's not just one person. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I guess I just never had that kind of like jealousy, which you've seen in even like, you know, made huge bands, you know, mm -hmm. that 
you know, there's always been like the guitar player that has the issue with the, the lead singer because they're getting more time than men. Right. And, um, yeah, fortunately I, our dynamic within sirens, it's never, no one's ever been like fighting for what Kellen has or to like be, you know, take away from his spotlight, you know? And, um, he's, and it's funny because he's the most like grounded dude. I know like over the many years of being in this band, you hear all these rumors about him and he's a dick and he's, he's, he's a, a tyrant or what, like crazy stories. And I always just laugh. So I'm like, no, he's just like, he's a dad. Like he's literally a, an amazing father who is a total nerd, you know, he, and he's just, and he, he doesn't even see himself as, um, as, you know, like a popular singer. It's so weird, even still, you know, he just doesn't, he doesn't like see that or view that at all. And I think that that's also a great dynamic that we have in our band is that we keep each other grounded. Like no one gets a big head because we're all the first ones to roast each other. If like a little bit of ego starts like coming out, we're the first to just roast each other and just like, keep nope. each other grounded. I think that yeah. that's been a great thing of, of being in this band is that, you know, we don't, we don't have those kind of like big egos and like, this is, I I'm, or, you know, Kellen being like, I'm the lead singer and the spotlight needs to be on me. Cause he's right. not, he's not like that, which makes for a great, um, just family, um, and work experience. You know, when I've been in that kind of situation in the past, not musically, but you know, in business and stuff, when I've worked for, you know, people who are, you know, kind of the face of the company, the CEO and stuff like that. Um, I am totally happy to sort of play the support role. Cause I don't really like, it might seem weird since I have a YouTube channel and stuff, but I don't actually enjoy being in the spotlight necessarily. You know, like I have, yeah. I do this cause I have something to say and like, I want to say it, but I don't, I don't want attention for attention's sake. You know what I mean? And I especially like with, you know, people like Kellen and Craig, like at their peak, uh, that seems like it would have been really annoying to be in that sort of. Yeah. Way. And uh, I me. think it's been, it's difficult. It's difficult for him. And, and I see how patient he is when we're in public. And he, I mean, to be honest, he like Kellen gets spotted everywhere. Yeah. Sure. And anywhere we go, like he gets, he, he gets I mean, spotted. I get recognized and places. I'm sure he gets recognized a hundred more times than I do. <laughs> yeah. He gets recognized quite a bit and he's always just so like quiet and cool and humble about it. And, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's cool to see because I, I've been in positions before with other artists where they're not like that. And it's not fun to be around or to be a part of. Right. So where do you, you know, given that you have in the past, uh, kind of been willing to walk away from music, do you think you'll be doing this for the rest of your life? Or do you think that this will run its course or what do you, what's the plan? What are you going to do with the rest of your life, Nick Martin? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think so. You know, I, I, but I will say that I will do this as long, as long as I can until the wheels fall off. You know, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. It's interesting that I feel more invigorated and, um, uh, you know, like, I, I feel like I've barely started and I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I'm more like in this mind space or this mindset of like, let's take this as far as I can versus how I felt in my twenties, you know, like, you know, now approaching my forties, I feel like I have that feeling of like, I barely scratched the surface. So, um, so when it comes to music, like I still see myself doing this for a long while, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know, um, like how, how long exactly. Um, but I do have like other interests, like I'm starting a coffee company and, um, I, you know, want to explore other areas of life outside of, outside of music, but, you know, music is still first and foremost for me. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens after this 
next record and see what we want to do next or not do next and just just take it from there you know i feel like in a way being willing or not not willing but knowing that you can do other things with your life is actually makes you better at being a musician or a creator because you can take more chances and take more risks and you don't you like you're not operating out of fear of like oh this next one has to be big because it's the only thing like oh my entire life rides on this next tour or record or whatever you're like nah like if this doesn't make sense anymore then i'll do something else in my life and that's okay so we're just going to do what we want yeah that's exactly it and i brought it up to the band over you know the many years that we've been together that you know if one day someone says like i don't want to do this anymore then that's okay like i wouldn't i wouldn't fight for them to like keep on doing something if they're not having fun if they're not enjoying themselves if it's not fulfilling anymore because i because i get it because i've been in that position of i don't want to do this anymore right. and i think that for me it was so important for me to step away because once I got back into it, it really made me realize how much I truly love what I do. And I think, you know, having that, having that time to reflect and to do something else, do something completely different outside of music and then coming back to it and real and realizing like, wow, this is actually a huge part of me and what is fulfilling for me and realizing that there's other things too that are fulfilling and that's also a great thing and like you said um it's 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 nice to just know that there's other things for me to explore in my life and i'm fortunate enough to be able to do that and yeah i it's i'm i'm a really i'm a really fortunate dude you know that's had a rad career and if it ended tomorrow I would be completely okay with that and move on to something else that, um, that, that gratifies me. So you mentioned mindset earlier. Uh, you strike me as somebody that puts a decent amount of energy into that, into kind of managing your mindset. Is that, am I, am I correct? Yeah. And I think that's still something that I'm, that I'm still working on. You know, I think that actually, as I've over the last few years, you know, I've been in therapy. I do, I do therapy once a week and I've been consistent with that for God, coming up on like two years now. And that's really helped me dig in even more on myself and, and really, you know, figuring out my mindset and what it is I want to do and what I don't want to do and what's authentic and what's not authentic. And when you start really having an open mind within yourself to all of these, all of these things, and you're picking yourself up apart in a, in a healthy way, yeah, um, it's empowering. But yeah, I'm definitely I, I I think that that's something that I'm still working on is my mindset and being even more strong with it and more powerful with it. I guess. What are the specific things you're working on, if you don't mind me asking? Um, you know, I personally, I, I struggle with, um, with self-esteem issues, you know, I, and I go in waves with it of like confidence. Um, and I think that throughout the pandemic that really, that just, just hit me so hard because, um, there was a realization that I had so much of myself into the band and like nothing else like mm -hmm. suddenly it was like if the band ended right now like what would i do like if you're um, not playing shows what, who are you yeah yeah exactly it you know, it was i'm still i feel like on this like kind of self discovery journey and i'm 38 like dude it's 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 crazy that when you're a kid you think everyone who's like over 30 is like has all their shit figured out and like oh it's like adults are all like perfect humans. Right. And then you get to be 30. You're like, Holy shit. I don't know anything about anything. Exactly. It. Exactly. It. So yeah, I've, I've been working on that. And I think that that's where, you know, even starting a YouTube channel, um, I'm starting that in like March or April, like just doing, finding other creative outlets, 
Um, and I knew that the, those all exist before and I was capable of doing them. I just wasn't doing them. So um, just taking a bit more of action, like just taking a few more steps as opposed to kind of just sitting and waiting. Um, and now we're starting a coffee company and whatnot. Like it just really just trying new things and like saying like, who fucking cares if it, if it quote unquote fails, like yep. I'm not going to know unless I fucking try. So um, that's been something that I've been definitely working on more understanding about myself. There was a Bruce Lee poster on the wall of my old MMA gym that I just randomly saw out of the corner of my eye that really stood out to me one day. And I've kept, kept it in my mind ever since action is the road to self-esteem. Like anytime yeah. I am scared or doubtful or whatever, I'm like, okay, what can I start doing? Like literally right this second that will make me feel like I took action towards this thing I'm afraid of. Like that could just be sending an email or whatever it is, like just some little thing. And without fail, if I just do something, I'm like, okay, I feel like 50% better already. Yeah, absolutely. It, because I, and I think that I always had this, I had a mindset that things will just get better. Like if I just, if I sit still long enough or when, when tomorrow comes, like when I wake up in the morning, like things will be better and maybe they would, but more often but why? times than not wouldn't. What, what, yeah. What is the thing that would make them better? I, I have the exact opposite problem of like, I feel like if I'm not constantly doing something, my life will fall apart and everything will be terrible and awful. If I don't work every single second of the day forever. <sighs> Do you feel like that's something that you're still like, are you working on that? Or is that just something that you just know and understand about yourself? Or you're just like, I just have to, I'm just doing this. Uh, it's both. I mean, that's just the way I've been my whole life. Um, so I, I'm, that's not going to change about me, but I do need to just make sure that it doesn't um, cause problems. You know, it's like, all right, it's seven o'clock. How about I stop working and go hang out with my wife? You yeah. Know? And just like tell that voice in the back of my head, just chill out. Everything's going to be okay. Yeah, everything's gonna be good. And congrats on the new house, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, excited. You know, buying a house anywhere on the West Coast is not easy. So, uh, no, no we, it's we not. We sold our old place in Seattle and moved about seventy miles south. So that that's the move okay, awesome. is you know move out of the big city and go out somewhere uncool that nobody wants to be. <laughs> I think it's awesome, man. Congrats to you. Yeah. Um, well, are you cool taking a couple questions from the chat if we have any? Sure. Yeah. Let's uh, everybody drop your questions in the chat if you have one. Uh, I have a couple other questions, but let's uh, let's give the people a minute. Um, my question is like from you know being sort of I don't know if a fill in is the right word, but you know being a a short-term member of so many of these projects, like what, what would you say is like the one thing that you learned from kind of being able to drop into so many of these different, like high profile, successful bands? I think for me personally, I learned that I'm a versatile musician, you know, that I, you know, started out in punk rock and hardcore bands. And then I was suddenly in cinematic sunrise, which is a, like pop rock band and um you know then doing like Isles and glaciers with all of these people and writing a record writing and recording a record in like 10 days and and just knowing like i'm i'm capable of of doing a lot like i'm not just a punk rock or a hardcore guy and i'm not just um a emo rock guy or a pop rock guy that um that um, I, I can kind of float around because I enjoy all of that. And I think that that's something that I've passed along to other aspiring musicians is like, just don't pigeonhole yourself. Like don't, don't, or, you know, don't, don't put yourself into a corner that you have to be like one thing. Um, and I know that's fearful. It's a scary thing for artists. You know, I, I, I can, I know a lot of people within like the hardcore and metal community that would never dare do something in a pop realm because it, it, that would like tarnish their, their image or right. like not being metal enough or whatever it is. And, 
I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm a complete opposite when it comes to that, I guess. It's just over the years learning that I'm able to do a lot more than just one thing, but enjoying it too. You know? We've got a couple of questions here from, uh, well, first of all, we've got a, an undermined fan. Uh, Christian death says undermined is goaded. So there's that. Um, awesome. Two, two on uh, my, my friend, Tony, not a question. Just wanted to say undermined. was my favorite band of all time in high school. And I still love them. He sings for the band dragged under if you're familiar with them. So, uh, got some fans here, uh, from Chaco Pretz. What's the funniest tour moment you remember? Funniest tour. God, every day is funny, dude. Like, um, actually this popped up today in Twitter, a fan had remembered a few years back. We were in Nashville on Halloween and a few of us were going to see Foo Fighters play at the Ryman. Um, and the other, another group of people were going to just hit Nashville hard and, and party their asses off. And Justin, our bass player, <laughs> um, he decided to dress up as pubes. So he was head to toe covered in, uh, in, in just curly black hair. Like just big, he just looked like a big pube and we went to <laughs> that's the worst halloween costume i've ever heard of that is vile it, i'll have to find photos to send it to you because it was hilarious but he what happened that night is we went to hibachi dinner before we all parted ways for the night and i remember um the chef purposely like throwing the flames off this hibachi grill like straight at him just to see him go up in flames and i i remember just thinking that was the funniest like this and that's just like another day on tour like every single day on tour is just some stupid funny um time you know like justin is kind of like the the clown of the group so he's just always out of 10 and always just entertaining us so him almost going up in flames dressed up as pubes on halloween was one of the funnier moments all right uh What's a band you had no idea? This is from uh, As MC Eleven. What's a band you had no idea about until you played a show with them and are now a big fan? Oh, that's a good question. Um. Wow. We kind of like I had obscure answers for that for bands that no one has ever heard of still. Give us an obscure um, one then. I'm sure they'll appreciate um, it. When I was when I was in Underminded, we had um we had played this show in in Idaho and this band called Examination of the Um played and to this day, I don't know if I've ever seen a crowd do what they were doing like there were people running around the venue like they were um um like possessed by by demons like people that were running by themselves into walls and this band was just i don't know how to explain their sound they i guess they were kind of like reminiscent of bands like the locust and um kind of real um like chaotic sounding kind of metal like i guess it's kind of metal but this band like completely like changed all of us in just the way that at least for me uh, my approach to um to to live music and uh putting on just a crazy show the drummer was wearing like a leopard print speedo and um i remember that we came back from that trip and um I, we, we had played this record for like all the dudes who are now like Pierce the Veil and they loved it. And then we played it for, um, my boy Tino, who's in of mice and men now. And he like, he's like the biggest examination of the fan now. Like it was just this weird little band that no one had ever heard of that, like, um, uh, that in like influenced all of us. And to this day, I don't even know. I mean, I guess you go on Spotify and maybe find yeah. them i think they end up changing their name to exam but they're really hard to find but well that's, that's my just a great example of you never know you might think that you're doing something and nobody noticed it nobody cares um but you never know who's watching and what an impact it might make on them you know yeah so yeah, there you go exactly, this little band exactly 
has influenced all these, these huge bands. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite song you have played? This is from Matt, Matt Lan 175. What is your favorite song you have played between all the bands you have been in? Oh, shit. That's like the hardest question I think I've ever been asked. I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's so cliche to say it's like our new, it's our new music. Like we're playing a, you know, like I said, we're playing our first show back next week and it'll be the first time we're playing two songs that we've never played before. And I'm just so amped to, to play them. So I guess there's, I guess that's kind of a bias answer, but that's what I'm like. It's, I mean, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there any artists or music you are a fan of that would surprise us? This is from S Peoples 28. Yeah, I mean, I I'm I think you you had um said to you were talking about guilty pleasures. I'm that person that I I listen to so many styles of music and I've grown up that way. You know, I grew up in a household that my dad has the biggest record collection of anyone to this day that I've ever met. And I grew up on classical music and mariachi music and rock and roll and hip hop and punk rock um, and opera. Like I grew up on so many types of music. So I've always had a very, very eclectic um, mind and taste when it comes to music. Um, I guess recently, like I, I'm a fan of K-pop. I think K-pop is the jam. Like I think... I grew up a pop music fan. Like I grew up on Michael Jackson and Prince and Madonna in eighties. I grew up listening to eighties music. So um, I, I appreciate good pop music because I don't think it's easy to make. Yep. And I think that there's a lot of K-pop artists that are writing really po like powerful, catchy songs. So I guess recently that's what I would I would say it's Nick Martin is a, is a black, is a uh, black pink stand. You heard it here first. <laughs> I actually haven't listened to black pink yet. They're good. If you like it. If you, okay, if you like K-pop, you'll, you'll like it. Uh, yeah. From Kent Ninja. I don't know. I don't know if you have answered to this already or not, but what are your biggest influencers when it comes to guitar? Biggest influences on guitar. Um, I, I grew up in the MTV generation and I, um, when they played music videos and I remember just like green day watching Billy Joe. Um, I was huge into Metallica and Pantera. So watching like James Hetfield and Kirk Hammett and Dimebag, obviously those were definitely, um, influential for me to want to pick up a guitar like Kirk Cobain and Chris Cornell and Kim Thale from Soundgarden, like bands like that just, blew my mind or Daniel Johns from silver chair. I thought he was like the coolest guitar player. Um, yeah, I was just influenced by shit I saw on, on MTV that made me want to like pick up guitars. Cross plays says I'm from Nashville and I love the city as a designer and worked in the print industry for a long time. I also worked in printing for a long time. I feel like your knowledge and fins is priceless to me. I just want to say this interview was great and I hope to pick your brain sometime on design and print. I could talk about printing all fucking day long, but I don't think anybody wants to hear about trapping and overprinting and registration and shit, but I can talk about that shit all day long. Uh, yeah. By the way, like what, whoever that was at ASA, you can totally pick my brain. Would love to chat. I am still a person that I pick up t-shirts and I will examine the print on t-shirts. This and registration is shit. Like, Who yeah, printed this? Is, this? this is bad registration. <laughs> The, the under base is terrible on this. This is this plastic soling they use is yeah. way too thick. Um, the placement is terrible. Like I'm that person still. So I can't look at a t-shirt the same ever again. So many like nineties and two, the placement is the big thing for me. So many nineties and two thousand shirts had the weirdest placement. It's like halfway. Like, I mean, like your shirt, like oh, the placement is pretty or low, like the, you know, it probably be like the center would be down here. Not <laughs> right. up here. Weird. Just weird. Super weird. Uh, okay. Last question uh, before we let Nick go. Uh, do people often confuse you with the guy from the Beastie Boys? I've never heard that. I don't know I've what guy from that. the Beastie Boys. 
I don't know. But I will be. take that as a huge compliment because I love the B series. Yeah, who wouldn't? Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining. Really appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully we get to hang out when you come by uh, Portland or Seattle one of these days. Would love to hang, dude. Would love to hang. Big fan of everything you do. Keep on crushing it. Like you, you just, you set the bar real high for creators in general. I don't know if you, if you think that or know that, but you inspire me, dude. So super, super stoked to be able to finally chat it up and um, let's keep in touch, dude. Yep. Same to you. Talk to you soon. Okay, yeah, dude. Peace. Take care.